साउंड दगे Hello, am I audible to you people? Hello, am I audible to you? Good evening, Jeevan. Good evening, Kimalini. So, yes, Mahesh, shall we begin? Thank you. Reading from Ganesh. So let's begin the session here. Good evening, Lingueshwa. Hello, Ram Kaushik. So let's begin. This is the NEET PG 2021 recall question discussions on microbiology and biochemistry. So totally I have 40 plus questions assimilated for you and I hope I'll be able to do justice for giving you the answers. I don't think the session is just for answers here. Remember one thing, it has been a tad bit late. I actually should have done this on the same day of the exam, but I was not well and I was not having enough amount of time to recall all the questions. So on that basis, yes, I'm a Chahon Chirag Shivansh Divya Vinayak. So let me tell you one thing, I was not well, so I was not able to do it on the same day. So this particular session might have actually panned out. People might not be showing much of interest in knowing the answers anymore because it might be depressing. But let me try to make it as interesting or useful as possible to you. I'll give you as much amount of concepts that are required for you which can be helpful for the next INACT exam or for making yourself feel comfortable about whether there were some mistakes. See, silly mistakes are not just silly in this exam because this exam was a very tricky exam. It was really very tricky. Many people on the first hour after coming out of the exam hall, they said it was dead easy. Now, out of 100 people who took the exam, 70 people said they were easy. 20 people said it was moderate and 10 people said it was very difficult. But after one day, one whole day, that is after 24 hours, now the number of people who said it was very easy came down to 30. Most of the people said it was actually moderately difficult and many people said it was very difficult. So it is quite possible. Yes, I understand Subkuch not metha, but you could not study. It's okay, understandable. There are so many things that could be your problem. Many things would have been from the notes from many institutes, I understand. But the time is that we would not have enough amount of time to read all of them. So for that particular basis, high yield areas are definitely high yield. What do you definitely mean by high yield areas? If you read something for a particular amount of time, at least 60% of the information should be there in your exams to help you. This is what is our ultimate logic. Okay, now let's move forward. This is Dr. Minakshi Sundaram here. I'm a gold medalist in MD exams and I'm an educator for biochemistry and microbiology for the past 11 years. And I've been successful in placing various students in the top medical institutions everywhere. And I've been a prolific quiz master. And there is something called as plus subscription. And you can use Dr. ASM Live to actually subscribe for an academy. 
and uh, there is something called as iconic subscription you can have the best of an academy and the best of Reptara coming together again you can use the code dr asm live to get 10 percent off on the discount the subscription and have exclusive access to all my classes and uh, one more thing there is a feature called as raise your hand in all the classes nowadays so if you click on raise your hand the teacher will allow you to ask you can directly talk to the teachers while in the live class this can actually help your interaction better with the teacher okay so let's begin with the first question a patient from Uttar Pradesh area with fever hepatosplenomegaly was subjected to bone marrow biopsy which revealed macrophages under microscopy containing an organism showing its kinetoplast stage what's the vector causing the condition what is your answer people And please let me know if these options were the correct options. Yes, the answer would be sandfly. This is a case of visceral leishmaniasis. And what are the things you have to know about kinetoplasts? Kinetoplasts are called as the mitochondrial equivalents. And remember, kinetoplasts are very important because they have energy axis. And the kinetoplast is a network of circular DNA. They refer to as small k DNA inside the bigger mitochondrion. And inside the bigger mitochondrion, there are many copies of mitochondrial genome, which can be helpful for you to understand. Macrophage is infested with intracellular leash mania, donovanite bodies, arrows characterized by kinetoplast and characteristic double dot appearance. This is how the picture should be. Watch very carefully. This is the nucleus and this is the kinetoplast. Macrophage infested with intracellular leash mania donovanite bodies are also referred to as LD bodies are the ones that will be taken into consideration. And leash mania is spread by phlebotamine sandfly. Phlebotomine sandfly. And here, if you notice very carefully, these arrow marks are describing the bodies. And if you go here, these double dots are the ones which are speaking about the kinetoplasts. Is the picture visible for you? Is the picture visible for you? Okay, thank you very much. Now look at this case here. 14 year old boy presents with edematous red plaques over the areas that have lost sensation. So it means you're looking at hypoanesthetic patches. You're looking at hypoanesthetic patches. The plaques were painful. Whatever you're seeing here, they are painful and they are tender with an acute onset and they have been here for the past last one week. He was previously diagnosed as multi bacillary leprosy patient and, uh, and was on treatment. What is the diagnosis for the current condition people? And whatever I am showing in red are actually doubtful things. I do not know whether they are the exact options in the given question. So for that reason, I am telling you, tell me, what do you think is the answer here? Uh, Divya Gurunathan, there is another question that comes later. That question is about purely type 2, erythema nodosum leprosum. This is not erythema nodosum leprosum. So what is the answer here? I am speaking about a different question altogether. Okay, if this was the question, this question was given to me by certain students and if this is the question, the answer would be type 1 reversal reaction. This is type 1 reversal reaction and how did this happen? Because the patient was on treatment, the patient options was totally different no no no. this is a different question altogether see there is one more question I'll show you that question here this was the question you're looking for isn't it Ashad Malik and Divya Gurunathan this is the question you're looking for
yes or no this is the question you're looking for right and uh, there is one more option continue ALT plus start steroids now does it make sense Okay, what is the answer for this question? What is the answer for this question? Yes, so you have to continue the ALT and also maintain the steroids. This was the question. So we'll go back to the original question here. This was, If this question was non-existent, then we'll stop it. There's just type 1 reversal reaction. I got this question from someone. I do not know what it is. And remember, it is not. A, if this was the question, there is no downgrading reaction. Downgrading happens only when there is no ALT. If there is ALT and if it is happening within less than 6 months of initiation of treatment, it's called as type 1 reversal reaction if it is happening after six months it is called as type 2 reversal reaction this is what i would want you to know okay now answer this 11 year old child presents with bluish white spots in the buccal mucosa or the mouth followed by skin rashes on analysis of the nucleic acid of the causative organism which of the following would be correct what is the answer here Okay, let me not ask you the questions and then give me the answers. If there is something wrong with the option, please let us know. Please let me know so that I will be able to change the whole activity. If it is, if any of the options are wrong, you please let me know. Otherwise, I will read the question and give you the answer. These bluish white spots across the molar, opposite to the molar tooth on the buccal mucosa is referred to as what? on the buccal mucosa is referred to as the coplic spots and if there are coplic spots and there are skin rashes present you can think of the condition called as measles and if the virus is measles it's a single stranded enveloped rna is it plus strand or minus strand it's a negatively stranded enveloped rna and what kind of can you give me exam what kind of uh, strand is there for sars cov2 anybody sars cov2 what strand is it plus or minus SARS-CoV-2 is plus or minus okay SARS-CoV-2 which has caused COVID-19 is actually a plus SSRNA virus so this will bring us to the simple logic which are the viruses which have what kind of RNA please remember this this might come back in your next exam also and all these the information should help you for your INICT exam also remember SARS-CoV-2 is a plus minus plus RNA virus the only double standard RNA would be Rio Viride attacking human beings it's a double standard only double standard RNA attacking human beings would be Rio Viride and in case of minus SSRNA viruses, we have orthomyxoviridae which contains influenza type of viruses, the rhabdoviridae that contains rabies viruses, you can have paramyxoviridae that contains measles, you can, I mean, you can have also have borna viridae, arena viridae and bunya viridae, I mean, uh, it is not about the measles, I said, the rubella virus, I'm so sorry. When you speak about bunya viridae, it contains ruby viruses here we can focus on the paramyxoviridae which are also negative stranded borna arena bunya all of them are minus stranded that is negative standard rna viruses while your coronaviridae 
Toga viride, Flavi viride, Picorna viride, Astro viride, Calici viride, all of them are plus SSRNA viruses. So remember, Corona viride, the one that has the crown, will be a plus SSRNA virus. Okay, now look at the question here. Let me give you a simple explanation for this. A uh, patient from Uttar Pradesh is a known case of AIDS and presents with cough plus sputum and fever. Now, there are three types of questions which have come to me. Some students are saying that on examination, consolidation is found on the right infrascapular area with x-ray showing right lower consolidation with CD4 count of 55. There are some people who are saying there are crepitations and chest x-ray showing opacity on the same side. And there are some students who are saying x-ray findings are showing patchy ground glass appearance. Can you tell me which one is the right word? Can anybody tell me, confirm what is the right question? Okay, let me make this very simple. Okay, you are saying second one, coarse crepitations and chest x-ray showed opacity. Okay, so you are saying one and two were seen. Are you all sure? Okay, excellent. Now, listen very carefully. In this particular situation, you have to remember one thing. There are two types of pneumonia. One is typical pyogenic pneumonia. The other one will be atypical pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia can be caused by atypical bacteria. They can be caused by viruses. They can be caused by protozoa. And also they can be caused by pneumocystis. Now, in case of atypical pneumonia, the most common presentation you see would be interstitial pneumonitis and you can have ground glass opacities. Well, in case of typical pneumonia, you can expect consolidation and if it is typical, you can divide them into lobar and bronchopneumonia. If it is lobar pneumonia, the most common cause would be pneumococcus. If it is bronchopneumonia, the most common cause would be Staphylococcus aureus in general. In lobar pneumonia, the next most common cause will be Haemophilus. The third most common cause will be Staphylococcus aureus. Now look at the question here. They are saying it's an AIDS patient. When they say AIDS patients and CD4 count of 55, there is a very good chance that most people could have chosen Pneumocystis carini. But if they had mentioned patchy ground glass appearance and if they say it is interstitial pneumonia, then I can choose Pneumocystis carini. But most of you are saying that this is not patchy gr ground glass appearance. So if we cut off this information, then consolidation will speak about typical pneumonia. No matter whether a patient is AIDS patient or non-AIDS patient, whatever the condition is, the most common cause of lobar pneumonia with right lower lobe consolidation would be your pneumococcus. So I would choose pneumococcus over any other organism any day. Next question. Uh, look at the picture here. This is called as consolidation pneumonia and these are called as interstitial pneumonia for your reference. Corby vivek, it is streptococcus pneumoniae. That is what I wrote it as pneumococcus. It is streptococcus pneumoniae. The other name for streptococcus pneumonia, the newer name is called as pneumococcus. That is the right answer. Okay. Let's go for the next question. Blood spills in hospitals is cleaned by... If there are blood spills, you will not be, that is, on the floor, if at all you want to clean it, you have to use a very powerful agent and that is sodium hypochlorite. It is sodium hypochlorite. The answer would be sodium hypochlorite, 1% to 2%. Next question, a young girl presents with massive myoclonic seizures and is exhibiting poor performance in school activities. Her history did not reveal any significant features. She gave a history of fever with rashes around one year of age, which resolves spontaneously. EEG shows burst pattern of waves. Which of the following might be identified in the girl? I would choose CSF IgG for measles. And why am I saying that? Because this is looking like a case of SSPE. I am not pretty sure about the remaining information. If the information is correct, then look for SSPE. First, look at the diagnostic criteria diagnostic criteria in case of SSP, you divide them into major and minor criteria. How do you make the diagnosis? You look for two major criteria plus one minor criterion and if at all you look for the atypical presentation of SSP. If at all it is SSP, I am sorry for writing it here, I will revise all these things. If you want to make a diagnosis, you can actually go for two major plus 
one minor criterion or if at all you are focusing on an atypical presentation of SSP that is not a regular presentation of SSP if it is having an atypical presentation of SSP then you can look for five or six criteria to be needed in terms of making a diagnosis what are the most major criteria you have to go for elevated sinus cerebrospinal fluid measles antibody titers the second one is typical or atypical clinical history that is progressive subacute progressive chronic progressive chronic relapsing remitting all kinds of activity when it comes to minor criteria eeg you have periodic complexes where burst waves can be noticed increased cerebrospinal fluid igg brain biopsy and special tests now look at how exactly they're speaking about this here, clinical, you have to go for progressive subacute met, mental deterioration with typical signs like myoclonus. When will you expect myoclonic jerks? In stage 2 of the SSP. And antibodies to aquaporin 4, look at this. They had actually asked in the question, CSF anti-AQ4. Anti-AQ4 antibody constitutes a sensitive and highly specific serum marker of neuromyelitis optica and it can facilitate the differentiate between neuromyelitis optica of Devic with that of classical multiple sclerosis. You use it for differentiating between that of classical MSN, neuromyelitis optica of Devic. So, next question. This will not... Okay, just have a look at this. Young child with hydrocephalus underwent operating correction, shunting two years back, who later came with his mother and presented with irritability and headache of three days duration. What is the next best step? What is your answer, people? Okay, so this question and exact answer, look at this part. First, you perform, if at all, a shunt has been made and if you expect complications, how do you know there are complications? In infants and children adults, there is a difference. In infants, if there is enlargement of baby's head, fontanelles are full, prominent scalp veins, swelling from the shunt tract, vomiting, sleepiness, irritability, all can contribute to the complications. In children and adults, again, you can look for vomiting, headache, vision problems, irritability, swelling along the track, personality changes. Personality changes can be noticed in case of children and adults and difficulty waking up or staying awake are all features in case of complications. And if you expect complications, first you run USG, CT and MRI. And if they are not functional, then you can go for shunt patency study or shuntogram. Then you can go for shunt tap. It's a diagnostic screen for test for screen for infection, confirm that the shunt is still functioning. The skin, the area of the skin overlying the shunt reservoir is cleansed with a sterile antibacterial solution. For a shunt tap, a small needle is used to pierce the skin and access the shunt reservoir or antechamber. So you can choose what kind of answer you would like to give because this is not purely a microbiology question per se, unless they prove that it is, they say that the shunt is an in situ, okay? So you can go for extra ventricular drain and monitor the intracranial pressure if possible. Okay, so this is not confirmedly an infectious case or anything. It can be multiple complications in that. So a better the better person to answer this would be a neurologist. So look at this question here. 23 year old female, primi gravida and whose school going cousin staying in the same house contracted varicella infection the patient approached medical center and the testing of the varicella antibody was done so for the pregnant female the varicella antibody test was done the antibodies are negative some people are getting confused between varicella and zoster listen very carefully varicella zoster virus has two phases in case of varicella's activity it causes chicken pox as a primary disease and once this virus is present in your body, it becomes latent because it belongs to the herpes group of viruses. Generally, DNA viruses tend to stay in your body longer than that of RNA viruses. And the reactivation is referred to as zoster or referred to as shingles. Now, we are saying that the lady is actually negative for varicella antibody titer. If she is negative for antibody titer, then you are expecting the primary disease to come and attack the lady and not the reactivation. So, the primary disease, for example, if she was already infected, 
and if you have antibodies positive if at all the antibodies are because of either vaccination or by prior infection the prior infection says there is latency now she may be susceptible for zoster but now she is varicella antibody negative so it is immune to chicken pox the answer would be chicken pox and remember when they say varicella it is the virus portion which is causing chicken pox the answer is immunity to chicken pox and the antibodies are negative there is no i mean i'm so sorry the answer is susceptibility to chicken pox it is not about if there is antibody negative immunity to zoster or immunity to chicken pox both of them are wrong because when you have antibodies you can't be immune if you don't have antibodies you can't be immune so if you think about the susceptibility for zoster or chicken pox the answer would most probably go for susceptibility for chicken pox let's go for the next question look at this here a patient is on long term steroids for chronic urticaria and recurrent eczema for 2 years is now present into the clinic with uh, itching and nocturnal cough bronco alveolar lavage was done which showed multiple small larvae what is the diagnosis remember capillaria philippensis ankylostoma caninum enterobius vermicularis these larvae have do not have much to do in case of lung the one worm whose larvae can be found in the lung will be strongyloides and what makes this diagnosis more stronger because the patient is on long term steroids remember chronic steroid intake or aids in these two conditions the worm that is very commonly known to attack human beings would be strongyloides trichralis and this organism can have the larval stages in the form of filariform larva and rhabditiform larva now whichever form of larva you are focusing on the larval form that can be seen in the lung will be the one that can be found in case of strongyloides enterobius vermicularis is known as seat worm and it can be spread through auto inoculation especially in case of children who are in the day care center and ankylostoma caninum is known for causing migraines larva migraines why because they do not know where to go inside the body and they get lost once they enter into the body next question a patient serum sample was sent to the lab for an agglutination test did they give it as standard agglutination test people was it given as standard agglutination test Did the question carry the sentence standard agglutination test? I'm not sure. That's why I'm asking you. Okay. So remember, standard agglutination test is actually a type of gold standard test when it comes to brucella. and here you will be having a problem with differences in the concentration of antibody versus antigen now some students were asking me why not inadequate antibodies inadequate antibodies does not actually have anything to do with this particular statement you have a concept called as pro zone versus post zone pro zone versus post zone watch very carefully initially you have a laboratory becoming negative but when the serum sample was actually diluted you tell me what will go down if the serum sample is diluted if serum sample is diluted whose concentration will go down the antibody concentration or antigen concentration see whenever the antibody is more than antigen or antigen is more than antibody you will not get a flocculation you will not get an agglutination you have to have the concentration of both of them becoming similar only when the antibody's concentration matches the antigen concentration you will be able to get a response so you tell me people whenever i try to dilute the serum sample what do you expect when i try to dilute the sample what do i expect we are looking for the antibodies from the sample so if you try to bring them down you will be able to have a better answer so in case of this the negative answer the first report to be negative was because of pro zone phenomenon later after dilution you are able to match the antigen with that of antibody you will be able to get the right answer now there is an option 
in case of a false negative brucella test there is one more reason listen very carefully in case of false positive brucella test there is one more reason i'm, I'm sorry false negative brucellosis we have one more reason one is the prozone phenomenon the second is incomplete antibodies incomplete antibodies who cannot react with who cannot react with the antigens are the ones who can give you a false negative answer so here inadequate antibodies cannot be the answer incomplete antibodies can be an answer there is no concept of complement inactivation here so you can be chilled about it let's look for the next question here a patient presents with erythral discharge which looked like a flow of seeds as shown in the picture i didn't add the picture because it was a very universal picture they said the pus was coming out like a flow of seeds and it is not herpetic infection it is clear gonococcal infection we don't have to discuss much about it now let's look at this picture here a parasite with its microfilarial forms having a sheath which shows its presence without nuclei at the tip identify the helminth or the worm or the parasite i do not know what they asked you but remember this question has been repeated seven times in the last five years over different exams the key word is ucheriria bancrofti will be a sheet microfilaria containing organisms point number one and the second thing is it is tail tip being free the tail tip of ucheriria is free that is the information that has been asked many number of times this is a very very commonly repeated question so i am pretty sure you would have answered the question right disease outbreak with fever and lymphadenopathy is due to the bite off see they are asking you for the vector the remaining two options were not given to me so i'm really sorry about what it was but this is clearly a case of bubonic plague bubonic plague remember in bubonic plague you have ring around the roses the central area will be pink the peripheral areas will be the peripheral areas will be black so this is referred to as black death and in case of black death the causative organism is yersinia pestis and the vector that is transmitting yersinia pestis will be xenophila chiopsis okay in a community attacked with an outbreak of multiple cases of encephalitis what is the type and route of administration of the vaccine which is under universal immunization program now tell me what is the most common cause of community encephalitis what is the commonest cause of community encephalitis please give me some answer is it killed or live vaccine someone give me an answer because you got your you all know your answers you may not be very interested it's okay so let's go forward this would be a case of subcutaneous vaccination okay then so let me go to the next question if you are really not in the mood to answer not a problem now 
Let's look at this question. A group of friends had a party and two of them continued even after the party was over. They had pastries from a roadside shop late into the night. And I had discussed this many times. It was, if it was pastries, they are supposed to contain processed milk in them. Processed milk is a very common source for Staphylococcus aureus. Because when you say dairy products, you can easily think of Staphylococcus aureus. And if at all, there is a crampy abdominal pain. If it is crampy abdominal pain, then I would definitely choose Staphylococcus aureus. Some people were arguing saying that it was over the night. So it can be almost 12 hours, right? Generally, Staphylococcus aureus toxin will act within less than 6 hours, of course. But if it acts at 12 hours, there is no point with which you will be able to ask a question. You cannot ask a question saying that why Staphylococcus aureus, why are you acting after 12 hours? There is no such point of things. It can happen within less than 6 hours, but it can happen over 12 hours also. And why am I saying this? If at all they have abdominal pain which is crampy, it has to be Staphylococcus aureus. But if it is Chinese food or if it is Chinese restaurant syndrome or if it is, if it is vanilla sauce, then you can think of the emetic form of bacillus cereus. Is that okay? Can you anybody tell me what kind of, did they speak about uh, abdominal cramps at any point of time? And were pastries given for the answer? Okay, it's okay. I don't, I'm not receiving any answers. It's not a problem. When there are pastries, if there are processed milk in it, I can think of Staphylococcus aureus. But if the had said vanilla sauce and Chinese fried rice, then you can go for bacillus cereus. It's up to the question here. A young child presented with history of pharyngitis. So a throat swab was taken and sent for culture. After, after the swab collection, the swab material should be disposed of into which of the following? And it's a clear case of yellow bag. I don't know why they gave you a concept called as white box. They could have said the same as white bag also. Yes. If pastries are given in the option, then you can simply go for Staphylococcus aureus blindly. And remember, recyclable infected waste is disposed of using red bins. But rubber materials like Foley's catheter, nasogastric Riles tube, all can be sent through red bins. But if it's infected cotton swabs, you have to go into the yellow bins. It is as simple as possible in case of PSM and biomedical waste management. Okay, now look at this question here. A young patient presents with 60 or 70 or 80 percent burns. I'm not very sure. Most people are saying there are 70 percent burns in the patient. The burns got infected and while investigating for the infectious agent, a sample from the burn site was collected and a test was shown in the picture as done. I do not know which picture was added. Was it this picture or this picture? Was it A or was it B? Which picture did they show? Okay, so there are used this picture. This is a case of oxidase test. This is a case of oxidase test. An oxidase test speaks about a relatively aerobic organism and which of the following is involved in the given picture. I do not know which options were given except pseudomonas. So it's a clear case of pseudomonas infection. And remember one thing, many people keep believing that pseudomonas is the most common cause of burns infection. Remember one thing, burns infection can be caused by pseudomonas and also by Staphylococcus aureus. Now, when you look at the community, if there is one pseudomonas, there is a huge number of Staphylococcus aureus. So when you focus on pure frequency, just the frequency alone, then you can think of Staphylococcus aureus. But if I keep a burns tissue here and I expose them to one pseudomonas and one Staphylococcus aureus here, pseudomonas has a higher affinity for the burns tissue compared to that of Staphylococcus aureus. On that basis, whenever you speak about burns infection, the organism you think of is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now tell me, which organism is more invasive, Pseudomonas or Staphylococcus aureus? Can you tell me which organism is more invasive, Pseudomonas or Staphylococcus aureus?
Yes, Staphylococcus aureus is very invasive, while Pseudomonas can be even more faster than multidrug resistant than any other organism. Let me give you a short idea about how exactly this oxidase test happens. The oxidase test requires a radical called as TMPD. I mean, it requires a chemical compound called as TMPD. TMPD is NNN tetramethyl P phenylenidamine dichloride. Okay, tetramethyl para phenylene diamine dihydrochloride TMPD. Now, this is an artificial electron donor. And when this artificial electron donor comes near a cytochrome C, it actually gets released the uh, electron and becomes a TMPD radical. This radical is a blue colored complex. Now, the cytochrome C will actually be oxidized and reduced as a cycle when the oxygen acts as an electron acceptor. Now, this oxidase test can be done as a wet filter paper method. It can be done as a dry filter paper method. It can be done as a direct plate method. It can be done as a test tube method or a swab method. So, there are multiple ways by which it can be done. This is an example of a slide method of oxidase positivity. The color you expect is a purple color. When you see purple color, what does it mean? TMPD radicals are formed after oxidation. This is the point I would like you to know. Okay. A truck diver on examination shows a well demarcated yet painless penile ulcer with indurations. To visualize the motility of the causative organism, which of the following is the best method? See the question. You can look at the organism is definitely Triponema pallidum. And what is confirming this diagnosis? The word called as induration. And they are saying it is demarcated and painless penile ulcer that also adds to the confirmation of the diagnosis because Shanker and the lymphadenopathy along with chancre, both of them are painless. And if you look at indurations, it can definitely confirm it as syphilis. Now, the Triponema pallidum as an organism will be motile. The motility is called as corkscrew motility. Now, you can visualize the organism under fluorescent microscopy. You can visualize the organism under electron microscopy. But if you want to look at the organism's motility, then you have to go for dark ground microscopy, also referred to as dark field microscopy. One of the investigations which determines and uses both the concepts will be called as Triponema pallidum immobilization test. Immobilization test. What exactly is the beauty of this test? If you have the organism being motile and if you add the serum containing antibody under dark field microscopy, if the antibodies are present, initially when the, ant when the organism is floating and rotating and moving like a corkscrew motility, in the presence of antibodies, the organism comes to a standstill. This is called as Tripodima pallidum immobilization test. That can be visualized well under dark field microscopy only. Next question. A young boy or child presented with bloody stools and cramping pain in the abdomen. Identify the medium used in the culture in the causative organism in the given picture. Uh, I do not know which picture was given, but this is a case of Shigella dysentery. It's a case of Shigella dysentery. If it is Shigella dysentery, I have to go for selenite F broth as an enrichment medium where F stands for feces. There is one more medium called as tetrathionate F broth that is also known for having feces. Now I had a confusion why many students were confused about alkaline peptone water. Alkaline peptone water is generally used for Vibrio and please remember Vibrio cholerae is never known for causing dysentery. It is always known for causing cholera which is never a food poison. It's a full blown disease that can kill a patient. Now if you think of dysentery that is caused by Vibrio Vibrio dysentery causing organism will be Vibrio parahemolyticus. If it is Vibrio parahemolyticus, then you can actually try to grow the organism on Vagatsuma blood agar. And we won't be generally speaking about alkaline peptone water there. Alkaline peptone water or Venkatraman and Ramakrishnan medium can act as transport medium for Vibrio cholerae. Brain heart infusion is generally a growth medium for growing microorganisms like streptococci, pneumococci and meningococci generally and they are also used to grow fastidious organisms. So, the best answer here would be selenite F broth. Examination of nose reveals a very roomy space with foul smelling yellow discharging granules. How do the granules happen? Because the rhinitis has lost all the fluid content and finally they have become solidified. Because the solidification, now you are able to see only granules and the loss of turbinates is very, very clear. Loss of 
yes it is also for salmonella salmonella enteritis is also capable of causing dysentery okay loss of turbinates will create such a roomy place there is no turbinates or conche conche are lost turbinates are lost along with that olfactory mucosa is also lost because the olfactory mucosa is lost he does not have much of a taste sensation or i mean does not have a smell sensation so even though he is very foul smelling he will not be able to sense it that is what you have learnt in ent in the form of merciful anosmia which is a very famous thing nobody will be unaware of this the causative organism is klebsiella wozeni this is a clear case of anaerobic infections that is why it is extremely foul smelling okay a young female presents with painless non foul smelling non itching profuse white discharge per vaginum on the 15th day of a menstrual cycle this is a very stressful period and it can come near the ovulation remember one thing as long as it is non itchy and non foul smelling we can't actually expect a foul play here this cannot be a case of any infection i would go for physiological reasons behind it and if at all you go for bacterial vaginosis then you can expect fishy odor and you can expect color changes here it is absolutely white so you don't have to go for a yes, patient had mycelonosmia very good so there is no color change he is white discharge now look at this case this is a case of paronychia along with that of a lesion here this might be lymphangitis as given in the picture did they inform it as lymphangitis people did they inform that there is lymphangitis okay so if they have mentioned it as lymphangitis the best answer would be streptococcal infections this can be a case of erysipelas and you can go for amoxicillin cloxacillin okay okay so if it was not mentioned then still it can be a lymphangitis because these rashes are speaking about superficial lymphatic inflammation and it can also be erysipelas in case so if that is the condition you can go for amoxicillin along with that of clavulanic acid okay now look at this a patient lives with his pet dog with whom he is physically close physically close means he keeps on petting and then he comes to the opd with a soft swelling of the scalp with red lesions and multiple pointing pus discharges what is the diagnosis it's a clear case of kirion remember kirion is very common in children but also found in adults who do not have much of stability of your thoughts when they don't take care of themselves very properly they can expect kirion to happen this kirion is an example of a dermatophytic infection and how do they describe the kirion generally when they say soft boggy swelling of the scalp with multiple discharging sinuses with multiple discharging sinuses then that is a case of kirion how do we call it as mycetoma in mycetoma the words that we use will be like this chronic hard indurated swelling with multiple discharging sinuses chronic hard indurated swelling with multiple discharge sinuses is mycetoma why am i telling you this now because you will come across this both in mycology these two are pictures of kirion i do not know which you got it but i hope you have answered it correctly okay which of the following can exhibit hair perforation test positivity remember the answer is trichophyton mentagrophytes the answer here is trichophyton menta graphites i know you would have had a lot of theory discussion about this that is why i am not trying to put a lot of stress on you and give you a lot of free information i am just giving you that information that is enough to choose the right answer here now there are some people who have a confusion can microsporum cause hair perforation what is hair perforation you keep a hair shaft and fill the solution with the organisms present here now these organisms 
can actually be causing tricks. It can either be ectothrix or endothrix. If you find the organisms entering into the hair shaft, it means the organisms are pierced through the hair shaft and they are present inside. And ectothrix means those organisms who are causing hair shaft infection by staying outside the shaft. Now, this microsporum can cause hair perforation test positive only if it is micro, uh, microsporum canis. Microsporum gypsum is not regularly known for showing hair, positive hair perforation test. But remember, hair perforation test is pi primarily done to differentiate between that of rubrum and mentagrophytes. Epimophyton is not even in the deal here. Look at this. This is the hair perforation test. Okay, Audoni, no problem. I will tell you one simple information. You have endothrix, tonsurance, violaceum, and sconlaney. These three organisms are known for causing endothrix and they can penetrate through the hair shaft and they can go deeper. There is something called as ectothrix. Ectothrix will be caused by Canis, Audoni, and Mentagrophytes. So, out of which we can go for Mentagrophytes. Audoni can also be a part of Ectothrix. The Mentagrophytes can actually cause a reversible inhibition and they can actually cause penetration and they can go deeper. How do they cause deeper? Remember, mentographites is the primary thing that is different. Yeah, that is fine, understandable. But please remember, the hair perforation test is primarily done to differentiate mentographites from that of rubrum. This is the common logic. Look at this part. This is taken from a research paper. And I'm just posting this information here. The test distinguishes between atypical isolates of rubrum and mentographites complex. The hairs exposed to trichoviral mentographites complex members show wedge-shaped perforations pertinent to the hair shaft. If this is the hair shaft, this is the wedge-shaped perforations present here. Whereas isolates of tibinar rubrum lack their ability to form perforations. Look at this. When I keep mentographites here, they can perforate like this or they can perforate like this. Is that okay? Can I go to the next question? Nobody told me till now Ordani was there. Ordani can slightly confuse the whole balance. Okay, this is how the test is performed. You can just have a look at it. Autoclaved prepubital hair can be cut into short pieces of 1 cm. Sterile distilled water 5 ml in a suitable vial. You place the hair in water and vial. Inoculate with small fragments of test fungus. Incubate at room temperature. Individual hairs are removed at intervals up to 4 weeks and examine microscopically in lactophenol cotton blue. Okay. Mentographa is produced, marked localized areas of pitting and marked erosion. This is the lactophenol cotton blue method. Okay, now we'll go for biochemistry questions. We'll make it faster. Weight of a man is given as 70 kg. His sodium levels were 120 milliculens per liter. He presented with disorientation or restlessness. So it means they're speaking about hyponatremia. So hyponatremia is causing the CNS disturbances. And they're asking you how much is the approximate deficit in the patient. Now, there are two ways of looking at the question. I have only one question to you. Please tell me whether 420 was there in the option or not. Was 420 a part of the options? Because this is very important to answer. Remember, 140 can be taken as normal. Sometimes 130 also can be taken as normal. Generally, mostly you will choose 140. Now, 140 is the milli equivalence per liter for a liter. Is that clear? When we speak about when we speak about the normal concentration of sodium, we have 140 milli equivalence of sodium per liter of body blood. In the blood, 
we have 140 milliequivalents per liter. Now we are focusing on total body water and we are trying to use the information of the concentration of sodium in the blood and trying to extrapolate it with the total body water's sodium content. I repeat once again. I repeat once again. We are trying to go for 140 milliequivalents per liter that is present in the blood. We are trying to extrapolate this information and to see how much amount of total body water sodium will be present. Now we look at deficit. This deficit can be calculated as either 140 minus 120. In 90 percent cases, there are some authors who can use 130 minus 120 also. If 140 minus 120 is taken into consideration, it is 20 milli equivalents per liter. Now you go for 60 percent of your body weight as a total body water. That means, how do you calculate? 60 percent of your total body weight, which is 70 kgs. So 60 percent of 70 kg would mean 6 sevenths of 42, 420. I'm sorry, 42. So sorry, 42. Now 42 should be multiplied by 20 as the difference. If you multiply 42 with 20, the answer would be 840 milli equivalents. This is the difference. But yes, yes, correct, Barnidharan, that is the right answer here. But if at all you go by old school method, then you go for 130 minus 120, which is 10 milli equivalents. Now, if you go by the same principle, again, 60% of 70 kilograms of total body water will be the total water content. So, again, you go for 42. 42 into 10 can be 420. I do not know whether they have given both the options here, but if at all they have given both options, go for 840. If there is only one option among 840 and 420, go for 840 once again. But if there is no 840, then still you can choose 420. That is why I try to give you the answer. Okay. I am just showing you how to operate between both the expressions. Okay. Middle-aged young farmer grew mainly, he grew mainly maize as a staple food. He presents with given picture, which amino acid deficiency will be most likely in the given picture. Remember, maize is deficient in tryptophan. Now, if they had asked you about amino acids in the question, the answer would be tryptophan. Some people said they didn't ask about amino acids. They spoke about the vitamin deficiency. Again, you remember, tryptophan can go through QPRTAs pathway and the quinolone pathway to enter into niacin synthesis. Remember, out of 60 grams of tryptophan, 1 gram of niacin can be generated. Now, if at all tryptophan is deficient in the maize, the patient will definitely have niacin deficiency. Now, let me tell you, you know all these things very well. You know all these things very well. This is a case of niacin deficiency, which is also referred to as pellagra. You all know this very well. This is called as Kessel's necklace. This class, I'm just going to tell you why exactly in case of niacin deficiency, you are having Kessel's necklace. And these are how the periphery of the foot and your hands can be seen. This is called as the great corn disaster. In that particular USA, you had a huge abramic wear. The people who are depending only on corn and maize, they had these kind of symptoms in a whole epidemiological area. Now look at this. Nicotinamide. What are the reasons why niacin is capable of causing pellagra? Nicotinamide has down regulatory effect on pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin 1 beta, 6, 8 and interleukin 12. It is also capable of decreasing the tumor necrosis factor alpha in a dose dependent manner. Nicotinamide has that kind of activity. It also induces activation of tumor necrosis factor alpha, catalytic induced macrophages, and inhibits the expression of intracellular region molecule. So, the point here is nicotinamide or niacin as such can decrease the pro inflammatory cytokines in a theoretical and, th and therapeutic conditions. If nicotinamide is deficient, then pro inflammatory cytokines can be elevated. Also, if you focus on nicotinamide, it's a potent. Okay, Shiva Shankari, history is like 10 days for triponema. Okay. Nicotinamide is a potent phosphodiesterase inhibitor, PDE inhibitor, and it suppresses neutrophil chemotaxis and mast cell histamine release. So, if nicotinamide or niacin is deficient, then there can be activation of phosphodiesterase and you will be having neutrophil chemotaxis, you can have mast cell histamine release, so it can cause intense amount of itching 
and itching can lead to scratching the scratching can lead to eczematous changes and the eczematous changes can also be seen in case of pellagra there are cases where without any kind of scratch also pellagra can happen nicotinamide increases biosynthesis of ceramides which upon degradation produce sphingosin this inhibits protein kinase c and decreases basal cell proliferation so when nicotinamide is actually now look at the sequence of events if you focus on nicotinamide here that synthesizes ceramide then degrades it becomes sphingosin that sphingosin can lead to protein kinase c inhibition and also it can decrease the basal cell proliferation so if nicotinamide is not there then protein kinase c will be elevated basal cell proliferation can increase and that is one of the reasons for such kind of lesions so i have given you the ultimate concept behind how niacin can actually be linked to this and what are the pathogenic changes that can happen in case of niacin deficiency look at this you can have endothelial lining going for proliferation along the lymphocytic that is along the blood vessels and around the blood vessels you can have lymphocytic infiltration this can lead to increased keratinization of the tissues and subsequent atrophy of the epidermis all these are the reasons for casals necklace the remaining things you can read when you try to pause it okay another question was asked i do not know what it is they said one was casals necklace photo was given question was what is the important thing to ask the patient diarrhea memory loss diet history remember this is a case of 3d also called as 4d diarrhea dementia dermatitis plus in the long run it can be death so diarrhea is happening because of mucosal inflammation and atrophy involved most of the git so poor kind of absorption malabsorption can be noticed the same thing can be expected in case gastritis and subsequent gastric mucosal atrophy all these things can be noticed and remember pathological changes in the nervous system can be found in the brain spinal cord peripheral nerve system and what are the reasons that you have dementia you have patchy demyelination degeneration of affected parts of the central nervous system so i have given you ultimate reasons for diarrhea dementia and dermatitis i hope you will be using this in your life i'm telling you for sure please remember if somebody asks you why there is pellagra what are the reasons behind pellagra one thing is in the skin you have endothelial lining going for proliferation as a vasodilatation part you have perivascular lymphocytic infiltration so it leads to increased keratinization and atrophy of the epidermis this is the reason for casals necklace and i have given you other reasons for casals necklace also in case of diarrhea you have mucosal inflammation atrophy of the git you have gastritis mucosal atrophy and why do you have dementia because the nervous system can go for pathological changes like patchy demyelination and degeneration of affected parts of the nervous system okay now look at this question many people gave me multiple things let me just clarify it for you see they said they are studying mitochondria genetics in lab when malate and pyruvate were added there was no change in the atp synthesis when succinate was added no change in the atp synthesis when they added malate pyruvate and succinate along with that of a particular toxin testing toxin there was no atp initially when the compounds added atp was produced but in the presence of toxin atp was not produced this is what they are telling you Sir Shankari, are you telling me or are you asking me? If at all there is a chancre, chancre is an active lesion. When you scrape from the chancre, you will be able to find the organism. The organism may not be culturable; it is not culturable. But you can put the organism on a dark field microscopy; it can still be showing you a positive answer. If it's a question, this is my answer. If you are saying it, it's okay. I accept your answer. Now look at this particular thing. This is taken from Harper. You have complex one. you have complex 2 here you have complex 3 here you have complex 4 here before i show you this picture let me just write it down very clearly for you look at this we have complex 1 we have complex 2 we have complex 3 we have complex 4 you have oxygen here when electrons are moving from a lower redox potential called as complex 1 to higher redox potential area called as complex 4 it creates an electron motive force that will pump four protons into the intermembrane space from here four protons from here and two protons here that will be equivalent of 10 protons per pair of electron that is traveling from the lower redox potential area to a higher redox potential area now when all the 10 protons are coming back into the matrix using your atp synthase complex you will be able to have that is when they are coming back into the matrix using atp synthase complex ADP will be converted into ATP. 
Now, whenever electrons are moving from one place to other and they reach the oxygen to become water, that is called as oxidation of electrons. When the ADP becomes ATP, that is called as phosphorylation. If they ask you, if they ask you, what are you trying to do? Whether you are trying to inhibit ATP synthesis. If you inhibit ATP synthesis per se, by attacking ATP synthase complex, then the drug will be oligomycin. But if they say, the electrons are flowing, electron transport chain is happening as such, but ATP synthesis alone is decreased, then that is called as uncoupling of oxidation from that of phosphorylation. If there is an uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, the drug will be 2,4-dinitrophenol. I repeat once again, if ATP synthase complex is inhibited, because of which ATP is not generated, the drug can be oligomycin. But if at all the electron transport is happening, but there is no phosphorylation of ADP into ATP, then it is called as uncoupling, called as 2,4-dinitrophenol. Now look at this question here. Malate pyruvate succinate was given in the question. Malate pyruvate succinate added the mitochondria produce ATP. For an adding the compound with malate pyruvate, there was a severe shortage of ATP. Then I could choose the answer to be 2,4-dinitrophenol. Is that clear? If they just want to call it as electron transport chain poison, it can be any of the one that blocks the complex 1, 2, 3 or 4. But if at all we speak about the FO portion of ATP synthase complex being inhibited, then it can be oligomycin. When they say the electron transport chain is continuing, but it is not producing ATP and the electron transport chain is increasing as a compensation, but still there is no ATP, then it will be referred to as uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. Now have a look at this. What is the role of atraclocyte? Atraclocyte also inhibits oxidative phosphorylation, but it inhibits the transport of ADP into ATP. It blocks ATP, ADP translocase. Oligomycin completely blocks oxidation and phosphorylation. Both electron transport and phosphorylation are blocked. That is called as oligomycin. If the oxidation is not blocked, only phosphorylation is blocked, then it is an uncoupler. Example 2,4-dinotrophenol and 2,4-orthocresol. All of them possible. Okay. Now, let's look at the last few questions. In case of a 9-year-old with cystic fibrosis, just one question. Did they ask you? Did they ask you whether it was cystic fibrosis or did you make a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis on your own? Did you diagnose it or was it given in the question paper itself? Okay. If cystic fibrosis was not mentioned and you still were able to make a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, hats off to you. They have given you it as recurrent chest infection, stool fat more than 10 grams per day. So, stool, stool fat more than 10 grams per day speaks about lipid malabsorption. Now, one thing I want to tell you is, see, in case of rectal prolapse, in case of rectal prolapse, the intestine telescopes into itself like a TV antenna being pushed down. Frequent coughing or hard to poor stools, both are properties of cystic fibrosis. They can occasionally cause rectal prolapse. It means out of 20% of kids, cystic fibrosis can be experienced. In cystic fibrosis, 20% of kids can experience this. So if you ask me, I will choose C. Also, there is a chance that if at all stool fat is going for malabsorption, there is a very good chance protein malabsorption can also happen. But protein malabsorption is not very strongly related to cystic fibrosis. It is in turn related to 60 different kinds of diseases. Mark my words, in case of 60 different types of, 60 different types of. Good evening, Akanksha Patel. 
yes it was not mentioned as csf understandable in 60 60 different types of diseases protein losing entropathy has been related with but there is no hypernatremia in turn you have hypovolemic hyponatremia why because if the patient is having severe cystic fibrosis there is always increased sweat chloride you are not having the chloride and the sodium being taken into the body so for the loss of sodium and water the patient will always be having dehydration so for that reason adh will be elevated and this adh is capable of causing yes it is capable of causing elevation now you can expect volume overload or volume loss in the condition you will have dilution you may expect hyponatremia rather than that of hypernatremia an intestinal obstruction is possible but not in nine years old group it is possible in case of young adults or adults and it is not fall in sweat chloride it is rise in the sweat chloride test is it okay is my explanation understandable Can I move forward? Some people said rectal collapse was not given. If it is not given, I can go for protein losing entropathy. If it is given, I will go for rectal prolapse. And then I go for protein losing entropathy. In case cystic fibrosis, you expect hyponatremia and you can expect intestinal obstruction, but not in nine year old child. This is the understanding. Let's go for the next question. In a patient who presents with tendon xanthoma, sometimes you can also call it as tuberous xanthoma, the biochemical investigation revealed LDL cholesterol to be elevated. If it is LDL cholesterol elevation, it has to be hypercholesterolemia, and that is why the patient was given statins. Now, familial hyperchylomicronemia can be because of your chylomicron elevation and what happens in chylomicron's elevation the lipoprotein protein lipase is not able to break down the chylomicron's triglyceride remember chylomicron's and bldl these two are rich in triglyceride chylomicron's are made up of 90 percent triacylglycerol while bldl is made up of 60 to 65 percent of triacylglycerol among these two, chylomicrons are very rich in triacylglycerol. Now, when you focus on Tangier's disease, it is not even related to hyperchylomicronemia or hyperlipidemia. It is a type of hypolipidemia. Now, look at this part. Type 1, type 2. Both of them are closer to each other because in both the conditions, you can expect triacylglycerol to be elevated. But here, the question is very far away from triacylglycerol. The question is related to LDL cholesterol. In case of LDL cholesterol, that is type 2 hypercholesterolemia, the primary problem is LDL receptor defect. Now, let me quickly tell you. Yes, Prasanna Kumar, we have discussed it already. Okay, now look at this particular slide. We have type 1 where chylomicrons are elevated. We have type 4 where VLDL and chylomicrons are elevated. Type 4 where VLDL alone is elevated. So, when you focus on chylomicrons alone it is type 1 only when you focus on chylomicron plus vldl it is type 5 when you focus on vldl and broad beta along with chylomicrons it can be type 3 so remember in type 3 and type 5 you have a combination of vldl plus chylomicron elevation in case of type 2a ldl is elevated in case of type 2b, LDL and VLDL both are elevated. Now, look at this particular picture as given from that of Harper. We have hyperlipoproteinemias. Type 1 is familial lipoprotein lipase deficiency. You are not able to break down the triacylglycerol because of which chylomicron levels are elevated. So, it is causing hypertriacylglyceridemia. Now, look at type 2a. This is familial hypercholesterolemia. 
where defective LDL receptors or mutation ligand region of APOB B100 is noticed. So LDL receptors are not able to accept the LDL inside. So LDL floats in the blood, LDL elevated levels are noticed. In case of type 3, it is called as broad beta disease or remnant removal disease. What do you mean by remnant removal? You are not able to remove the remnants of your VLDL and chylomicron. Your chylomicron after losing something has to become chylomicron remnant. VLDL after losing has to become IDL. So in both the conditions, you are not able to make a proper this one. That is, you are not able to create chylomicron remnants or IDL remnants. So you are left with chylomicrons and VLDL elevation. Now, type 3 is referred to as familial dysbital hypoproteinemia. Also, familial hyper alpha lipoproteinemia is called as increased concentration of HDL. Now, remember, there are two types of xanthomas. When they say eruptive xanthomas, think of triglycerides. When they speak about tuberous xanthomas or tendinous xanthomas, think of cholesterol. This is the logic I can tell you. Okay. Uh, of course, in case of LDL elevation, you can have increased risk of coronary artery disease. Increased risk of coronary artery disease in both hypo alpha lipoproteinemia and familial alpha LP deficiency. Remember, if it is hypo alpha lipoproteinemia, HDL is lesser, A1 apoprotein is also lesser. So there is increased risk of coronary artery disease. This is not the same in case of hyper cholesterolemia type 2A. Okay. Okay, what are the hypolipoproteinemia you are looking at? See, there is familial alpha lipoprotein deficiency, Tangier disease, fish eye disease, and APOA1 deficiencies. So, this is a hypolipoproteinemia, not a hyperlipoproteinemia. Okay, would you be interested to learn about rickets? Because I can tell you the answer. The answer for this question looks like it is X linked hypophosphatemic rickets. And you can make the diagnosis very faster also. The one simple clue is the, per, the child is a boy. If it's a boy, it can more probably be X-linked. If it is also a girl, there is a possibility it can be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. But because it's a boy, the chances of X-linked disease will be higher. Point number one. Now, let me tell you in simple words, how do I actually think of this situation? Why is it not nutritional rickets? Look at the logic here. If it is nutritional rickets, the calcium levels will become slightly lower. When the calcium levels are lower, parath hormone levels will start elevating. This will cause secondary hyperparath hormonemia. Now, this parath hormone has one function. It will decrease the phosphate. At the same time, increase the calcium. So, the calcium levels will not be very high, but they can come back to near normal levels. While PTH levels will be elevated, phosphate will be lower. Now look at the logic here. In this question, phosphate levels are lower and the calcium levels are normal. PTH is also normal. How can that be? That is why it is not nutritional rickets. For those students who kept on asking me whether it is nutritional rickets or not, whether it is nutritional rickets or not, no. Other important information that you have to understand is not nutritional rickets is, see, you do not have a nutritional deficiency of vitamin D. How do you know that? Because when you gave vitamin D, there was no response. So, vitamin D dependent rickets is also a wrong option. At the same time, this is not a problem of having less amount of vitamin D. This is a case of hypophosphatemic rickets. Now, there is another question. There is something called as hereditary vitamin D resistant rickets. Between these two, you have to understand rickets can be easily differentiated into two types. One is calcipenic rickets. The other one is phosphopenic rickets. That is in the disease, whether the calcium levels are falling or phosphate levels are falling. You tell me, if at all we focus on a parath hormone, parath hormone's primary function is to decrease the phosphate and increase the calcium. This will always be maintained as a cross product constant. That is, whenever calcium increases, the phosphate is trying to decrease. Now, PTH is the one who is trying to do this. Now, let me show you a few pictures here. Now, what happens in case of vitamin D, resist vitamin D dependent rickets type 1? In vitamin D dependent rickets type 1, you have this 1 alpha hydroxylase enzyme becoming deficient. 
If 1-alpha hydroxylase is deficient, the conversion of 25 hydroxycholecalciferol to 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol does not happen. So this one will be lesser. Now you can think of as it can be low or normal calcium in this condition, low or normal calcium. Good evening, Rubu Punya. The increased PTH for low calcium can seen again, hence low phosphate can be noticed. So you can have low or near normal calcium that leads to increased PTH and also you can have again low calcium and then you can have low phosphate. Remember, this is almost the same picture as what we saw in case of nutritional rickets. That is why we do not use it. Okay, next one. We focus on vitamin D dependent rickets type 2. In this end organ resistance is seen. That is, you are able to produce 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol, but its effect is not happening. Whenever the particular ligand is not actually sitting on the receptor, or the receptor is actually ignoring it, then you will try to overcome the inhibition or overcome the resistance by producing more. So, 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol can increase. This can differentiate between that of VDDR2 and VDDR1. Now, look at this particular slide. There are two types of rickets calcipinic rickets and phosphopinic rickets. Now, in case of calcipinic rickets, the calcium levels are falling, right? You have either vitamin D deficiency or resistance. So, calcium levels being low is the primary factor. It can be because of malabsorption, lack of sunlight, defect in 25 hydroxylation or failure of one hydroxylation of vitamin D or you can have end organ resistance. You can have calcium deficiency and also chronic kidney disease can lead to renal rickets. But what happens in phosphopinic rickets? It can be related to genetic mutations. X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, autosomal, resist, autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant or hypophosphatemic with hypercalciuria. All these things will produce lesser amounts of phosphates. So if at all you are saying phosphate levels are drastically low, then I can think of one answer. It is X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. You can. I'll just show this here. You can pause it and then take a screenshot. I'll pause it here. You can take a screenshot. This is a flow chart for clinical rickets. This is also an establishment of differentiating between calcipenic and phosphopenic rickets. Okay, they said there was a question suggestive of CML. What is the most sensitive test? They said immunophenotyping. They said CT scan. Immunophenotyping is good, but nobody can beat fish and PCR put together because they are the most sensitive. Any kind of nucleic acid amplification test will be highly sensitive. Okay, now look at this question. It's a case of history of dry skin. Dermatological findings are shown in the picture. The picture said two elbows were drawn. In that, a lot of keratotic changes were noticed and uh, the child had difficulty in vision in dark. Whenever they say there is a difficulty in vision in dark, it can be niclopia and I would think of phrenoderma. Remember, ichthyosis also comes closer and there is a disease called as Harlequin's ichthyosis where vitamin A deficiency can be noticed. Here, the problem is not ichthyosis as such, it is phrenoderma. Please remember, this is a case of phrenoderma because of one aspect that there is difficulty in vision in dark and it is happening on the elbow and knee in a child. Now I know a lot of discussion is already over. I'm just giving you the most important bullet points which can be helpful for making a diagnosis. And I ask you, phrenoderma can happen where phrenoderma can be present in vitamin A deficiency and vitamin E deficiency also. There is harlequin ichthyosis that alone can be caused by vitamin A deficiency and not all the ichthyosis. Pellagra is because of niacin deficiency. The options may be wrong, but if they asked about vitamin deficiency, then it is vitamin A deficiency. And uh, for those people who do not understand how exactly vitamin A is involved in this picture case, remember vitamin A can be of three forms. These are called as vitamins. The different existence of the same vitamin, retinol, retinal and retinoic acid. Now remember, retinoic acid is already an acid. This acid, by binding with another acid, cannot form an ester. So, acid can bind with only alcohol to form an ester. So, retinol is the one which will bind with palmitic acid to become retinoyl palmitate to bind into and be stored in the liver cells. Retinal is the form that is important for Wall's visual cycle. So, 
remember retinol and retinal are the ones which are involved in the wall visual cycle and floating in the blood but retinoic acid is the one which is not related to vision per se it is it is related to that of turnover of epithelium and if this is not available epithelial turnover does not happen increased keratinization happens the same thing happens on the conjunctiva or the cornea in the conjunctiva it is known for causing bite out spots yes essential fatty acid deficiency also can cause this one okay the first question was exactly correct then you can go for that okay and this is a straightforward question which glycosaminoglycan is found in the cornea the answer would be keratin sulfate keratin sulfate will be for your cartilages in a patient with cystathione and beta synthase deficiency which amino acid supplementation should be given let me give you in a very simple way you have homocysteine that will react with serine to form something called as cystathionine that will break into cysteine and homocysteine this cystathionin is formed with the help of cystathionin beta synthase if this is deficient your body is not able to convert homocysteine into cysteine through cystathionin so this becomes deficient the patient will be having hyperhomocysteinemia and he'll be having less amounts of cysteine at this point of time cysteine will not be a simple amino acid it becomes an essential amino acid you have to supply this cysteine from that of dietary sources this is what i would want you to remember also remember pyridoxal phosphate is essential in this step because pyridoxal phosphate is helpful in the transsulfuration reaction sulfur moves from one compound to the other compound transsulfuration reaction is done by plp and plp can be helpful for not only transsulfuration reaction transamination reaction decarboxylation reaction it supports glycogen phosphorylase enzyme it is also important for heme synthesis through delta amino levonic acid synthase enzyme okay 10 year old male child with generalized edema cholesterol levels between 200 to 250 mg per deciliter urine protein 3 plus and fat in the stools were noticed this is most probably a case of nephrotic syndrome and what happens in nephrotic syndrome the simple words is loss of basement membrane polyanions in nephritic syndrome there is inflammation this inflammation can cause injury that can lead to blood leaking into the urine so blood also leaks into the urine and albumin content also leaks into the urine both together can cause a cloudy kind of urine along with that of cola color but there is no blood involved in nephrotic syndrome if it was there it would have been in the question paper and there is no blood so this is a clear case of massive proteinuria massive proteinuria is purely a property of nephrotic syndrome and that is referred to as nephrotic range proteinuria and why cholesterol is elevated actually total cholesterol may not be affected but free cholesterol that is estimated in the blood is elevated why because you are losing the cholesterol binding or lipid transporting proteins also lost so when the lipid transport proteins are lost you can have cholesterol levels to be elevated uh we are coming to the last few questions let's move forward a patient presents with bone pain anemia hepatosplenomegaly bone marrow trifid biopsy reveals pan cytopenia it shows crumpled tissue paper appearance enzyme deficient is everybody would be knowing this answer this is a case of beta gluco cerebrosidase deficiency the diagnosis is gaucher's disease i understand this is a very delayed type of recall session i could have done the recall session on the day of exam the only thing is whenever the question is not completely given to me or the answers are not very clear i do not want to give you any wrong directions at the same time i was not well so you may not be very much interested in knowing this but if you would like to know should i teach you the sphingolipidosis only if you're interested in case you're here to just know the question and the answer and move forward i can tell you the answer is gaucher's but if you want to know how gaucher's comes into picture 
and uh, how the disease is to be learned i can teach you this that's up to you Okay, what happens in Gaucher's disease? First, let me tell you this whole pathway. Just look at it. This should be very simple for you. One single, one single information should be for you. We start with the amino alcohol called as sphingosin. Remember, sphingosin plus that of fatty acid together is called as ceramide. Now, you have to learn this pathway in such a way, you go in the reverse pathway. Thank you very much, MP. So, ceramide should actually break to become sphingosin and fatty acid. Now, if that ceramide should be broken open into sphingosin plus fatty acid, then the enzyme required is ceraminidase. If the ceraminidase, this video may not be very clear, don't worry about it. You, I can share the picture with you later. Don't worry about knowing all the small letters. I'm just telling you what is present here. Just look at this. We have sphingosin plus fatty acid giving you ceramide. If the ceramide has to break to release sphingosin and fatty acid, the enzyme would be ceraminidase. And if this enzyme is deficient, ceramide accumulates. That disease is called as Farber's disease. I am the god of biochem. Oh god, it is too much of words. Thank you very much. But I hope at least you will be able to understand what I am teaching. At that level, I will be very happy. Sphingosin plus fatty acid gives you ceramide. If you try to break ceramide back into sphingosin and fatty acid, then the enzyme should be ceraminidase. If that is deficient, the disease is Farber's disease. It is Farber's disease. Now, let's go one step backwards. Now, if I add ceramide, to ceramide to ceramide if i add galactose it's called as galactoceramide if i add glucose it's called as glucoceramide but glucoceramide or galactoceramide both are referred to as cerebroside so i repeat ceramide plus glucose or ceramide plus galactose both of them are called as cerebroside this can be called as glucocerebroside or galactoserebroside now from a glucose cerebroside where cerebride, ceramide and glucose are present, if I'm unable to remove the glucose, then the enzyme deficient is glucose cerebrosidase. If that is deficient, it's called as Gaucher's disease. I hope you'll be able to remember this portion. So if you want, I'll repeat this part alone. That is ceramide plus glucose is called as glucocerebroside. If I want to extract ceramide out of it, I have to remove the glucose. So the enzyme is glucocerebrosidase. If this is deficient, it's called as Gaucher's disease. So when I'm trying to remove the fatty acid from the sphingosin, that is, if ceramide is present, from ceramide, if I want to remove fatty acid or the sphingosin, the enzyme should be ceraminidase. If that is deficient, the disease is Farber's disease. Now ceramide is formed. Ceramide plus glucose is glucocerebroside. Ceramide plus galactose is galactoserebroside. From glucocerebroside, if I am not able to remove the glucose, then that is called as Gaucher's disease. Now, to the glucocerebroside, if I add one more sugar, that is ceramide plus glucose plus galactose, if I add one more sugar, the sugar content is increasing, so it is becoming global, that is globoside. Now, if to the globoside, if I attach n acetyl neuraminic acid, then Ananya Priyadarshini, we have only five more questions. I'm sorry if you're feeling it is very heavy. We'll finish it in another 10 minutes. In case of globoside, if I attach to the globoside n acetyl neuraminic acid, then that is called as GM3. If to the nana, along with the nana, if I attach one more n acetyl galactose, it is called as GM2. If I add one more galactose to it, that is called as GM1. So I think.
okay i don't think uh, you'll be able to focus at 10:35 in the night i'll have another special session where i'll teach you this only this particular table i'll teach you in a very elaborate manner for those people who are not very comfortable to learn for long sessions it's okay let me tell you just a small gist if you have ceramide plus glucose that is called as gluco cerebroside to the gluco cerebroside if i want to break it back to release the glucose in the ceramide then the enzyme would be beta gluco cerebrosidase if this is deficient that is called as gaucher's disease so if you have the gaucher's disease you will be having the macrophages carrying the gluco cerebroside when that accumulates bone marrow infiltration happens the real progenitor cells will not be present you have cytopenia and it can be macrophages called as the macrophage will be having lipid the lipid laden macrophages are gaucher cells if they are going in the spleen you can have massive splenomegaly cytopenia and hypermetabolic state in fatigue in the bone you can expect erlen meyer deformities and osteoporosis pathological fracture chronic bone pain because your bone tissue has been replaced by the lipid content in the lung allula macrophages happen so if the lipid is entering into the lung it is called as infiltrative lung disease and these are the pictures this is taken from frank netter's atlas you can have pinge clay in the eyes enlargement and cirrhosis of liver splenomegaly anemia thrombocytopenia and leukopenia you can also have osteonecrosis of the hip erlen meyer flash deformity pigmentation of skin all these are present in the chronic form in adult what do you expect in children bone pain hyperosinemegaly anemia thrombocytopenia osteopenia again allen meyer flash deformity bone marrow infiltration you can expect easy bruising or bleeding okay person had last meal at 8 pm and gave blood sample at 7 am from 8 pm to approximately 12 p 12 am his his dietary glucose will be helpful from 12 am to that of 7 am he is almost in the fasting state in the first 4 hours of the fasting your your glycogenolysis will be helpful but if at all it is till the 7 am then that is remember from 8 pm to 12 am his dietary glucose would be good enough between 12 am to 4 am you can expect the liver glycogenolysis to help him but glycogen will not be able to hold on till maximum 6 am but by 7 am if he is still having 180 mg per deciliter then it means gluconeogenesis is happening never ever can you choose muscle glycogenolysis because muscle glycogen is not contributing to the blood glucose because the deficiency of the enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase uh they asked you about identification of the enzymes present in this particular picture this is a case of pdh complex we have discussed pdh complex in and out and uh, in the pdh complex we begin with pyruvate pyruvate ultimately is to become acetyl coa now this pyruvate in the first step will be having this enzyme called as e1 in the next step the enzyme is e2 and the last step the enzyme is e3 this e1 enzyme is pyruvate dehydrogenase e2 is dihydrolipoyl transacetylase and the last enzyme is dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase i am not pretty sure how they asked this question i do not know how they asked the question so e1 is pdh enzyme e2 is dihydrolipoyl transacetylase enzyme e3 is dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase enzyme so i let me not go deep into this topic because we have discussed this particular pdh complex all the past question now i do not want to talk like a person who has taught you things but all these things have been done in the special classes and in the biochemistry classes also so i do not want to bore you to the death at this point of time so i'm just telling you the information here yes okay if combinations were name were given then pdh and dihydrolipoamide acyl transferase is the answer okay in this question more than 60 years old patient diabetic and repeated vomiting was seen low blood pressure 90 by 60 abg showing a ph of 7.52 see if the abg is showing 7.52 then it is alkalosis it cannot be dka and if it is vomiting if he is vomiting then because of vomiting he has lot a lot of hcl now the loss of hcl can cause hypo chloremia also remember he can also have hypokalemia why because in your body you have a bicarbonate and potassium bicarbonate and chloride antipotes this one can be sympotes 
in that area if you are not able to lose bicarbonate then you will be actually losing a lot of potassium so you can have hypokalemia and you can have alkalosis because obviously you have a lot a lot of acid you can have a lot of alkali being happening so sepsis cannot be the answer because generally in sepsis you expect metabolic acidosis the same thing is found in case of acute kidney injury also in acute kidney injury you will be having metabolic acidosis because there is a lot of vomiting the alkali has been alkali reserve has been increased that is the bicarbonate levels are increasing at the same time potassium levels are decreasing and the chloride levels are decreasing you expect vomiting to happen to cause metabolic alkalosis and uh, this is the picture to tell you how exactly this is the picture to go for understanding compensation whether the compensation was adequate or not to read that you can just pause the slide this is taken from dm vasudevan and uh, a last few questions a female with excessive breathing hyperventilation presence with spasm in the hands and foot this is called as the tetany you can have it as trosha syndrome or relative syndromes also uh, chostex sign all these things can happen as uh, as hypocalcemia when they speak about hypocalcemia you can expect the calcium levels to have fallen in the blood now look at this part total low calcium high free calcium both of them will not be the right answer because you are looking at fall in the free calcium and when can free calcium fall whenever the calcium is becoming more bound to the protein which is albumin why is the albumin capable of accepting calcium suddenly because the patient has had excessive breathing or hyperventilation because of excessive breathing or hyperventilation you expect respiratory alkalosis what happens in alkalosis you are having the oh minus ion being higher than the h plus ion that is technically the reason so when the oh minus ions are more on the surface of albumin negative charges are present progress limbu yes there are some free special classes you can see them under unacademy profile on unacademy i have done almost three acid base mcq balance but in the future also i'll be doing so you can be there with my uh, telegram channel you can search for the telegram channel using dr asms forum for uh, biochemistry and medical microbiology i will be posting the links now let me tell you this in case of this condition respiratory alkalosis is noticed in alkalotic condition the albumin becomes negatively charged when the albumin becomes negatively charged it tries to pull the calcium and attaches to that so the bound calcium is increasing the free calcium is decreasing total calcium may be almost unchanged so a is wrong d is wrong so among these two alkalosis is the right answer so c can be the right answer now look at this this is a very controversial question many people are actually arguing over this 20 year old girl having a sedentary job 12 to 14 hours on her laptop or pc and there is a non veg burger that she has eaten some people are saying non veg burger some people say just junk food no matter what it is they are saying junk food is the or fast food is taken it means no vegetables have been noticed when there are no vegetables which deficiency becomes important see it is not iron deficiency anemia because mcv is 120 and if you look at the two conditions you can have a macrocytic picture macrocytic picture can be caused by both folate deficiency and b12 deficiency but remember folate can come only from vegetables and fruits and folate is highly heat labile if folate is heat labile and it is present in the vegetables if the lady is not taking vegetables then you can expect folate deficiency more than vitamin b12 because vitamin b12 is most common source will be meat and then intestinal bacteria so here the answer would be folate deficiency now last few questions iron deficiency can show increase in all the following except see red cell distribution with will be falling distribution with means how the hemoglobin and the iron has been distributed if the distribution is actually yeah it will be rising because distribution with means in some particular rbc it is very less in some part rbc it is very very high so the distribution with is becoming more in case of iron deficiency so total iron binding capacity will increase if iron is deficient why when the iron is deficient you want more to bind but transferrin saturation is the one which can fall the simplest explanation is that transferrin saturation means it has to accept as much amount of iron as possible because there is iron deficiency there is no iron transformation 
okay junk food without vegetables it has to be folic acid the glucose of oral rehydration solution is transported mainly by SGLT1 because 1 is present in the intestines while 2 is present mostly in the kidneys and what is the beauty of this SGLT1 it is sodium glucose co-transporter what is the beauty of an oral rehydration solution you are using both glucose plus NaCl when the NaCl comes and there is Na comes and binds and the glucose comes and binds together they will be crossing the membrane so SGLT1 will be the answer in pancreatitis clinical history was given which is a specific marker let me tell you if at all lipase and amylase both are given I will choose lipase more than that of amylase because amylase can be coming from both salivary glands and also from pancreas if the patient is having subclinical salivary inflammation or peritonitis or any kind of peritoneal gland inflammation then amylase can be elevated but lipase comes from the pancreas as such so lipase is more specific but there is even more better marker which is proenzyme trypsinogen this proenzyme trypsinogen or serum trypsin level can be the most accurate laboratory indicator for pancreatitis if at all it was given then choose this if it was not given then go for lipase and then go for amylase okay so if that was not given then please go for lipase in HPCC what is the kind of defect to be expected a very simple question it's a mismatch repair picture what happens in HPHN and HNPCC it is hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer where Lynch syndrome is the other name for it the changes in MLH1 MSH2 MSH6 PMS2 EPCAM gene have all been found in Lynch syndrome now remember all these genes are involved in the repairing errors that occur when DNA is copied in the preparation that is called as DNA replication. So when the DNA replication is happening these genes are involved. When they are mutated DNA repair is not done properly. So because of improper DNA repair you suffer from it. Now remember the MLH1, MSH2, MSH6 and PMS2 are all involved in DNA repairs that occur during DNA replication where mutations in MLH1 and MSH2 gene leads to increased risk of developing cancer in a patient's lifetime while if there is a mutation of MSH6 and PMS2 then there is a lower risk for cancer development this is how the mismatch repair can happen but I would like to teach it in a different day as together but this doesn't look like a day where and this is not, this doesn't look like a time where we can discuss about the details so we could choose a better day uh, we'll choose another class DNA mismatch repair recognizes and repairs erroneous insertion deletion and misincorporation of bases they can arise due to DNA replication and recombination. It plays a role in genomic stability and cellular homeostasis. And a very famous and a very common question. A patient with ochronosis with a history of darkening of urine on standing darkens further even more after standing. Then what is the diagnosis? This can be a diagnosis of alcaptonuria where alcaptone bodies are formed. In two minutes we'll finish. Alcaptone bodies are formed. In alcaptonuria, the enzyme deficient is homogentisic acid oxidase. Remember, if tyrosine transaminase is deficient, it will be type 2 tyrosinemia, which is Rickner Hanhart syndrome. Fumarole estostate hydrolase deficient, it is type 1 tyrosinemia. And 4 phenyl hydroxyperidinase will deficiency can cause Hawkinson urea. So the answer should be homogenetic acid oxidase but if they are not given you oxidase then it might be a mistake in the question paper still I would choose only A and not anything else and uh, yes with this the micro microbiology and biochemistry questions are done I think it was a very late session it was done in a very delayed fashion I should have done it on the day of the exam so that many people have shown interest but uh, out of so many people who did not show interest at least you people showed a lot of interest thank you so much for being there with me it has been almost what one hour 50 minutes so we have discussed more than 40 questions and for all those people who thought it was helpful to you please put a thumbs up it can reach more people and uh, in case you'd like to have any special classes or free classes please comment in the section below after the video ends and uh, thank you very much and this is the time where uh, you should be preparing for NACT exam if at all you are actually boosted up for those people who are already very well done with their exams they wouldn't have been interested in these classes but those people who are showing interest you are trying to improve yourself further so your next time if it is NACT exam we will be there with you and help you for your NACT exam and uh, next week I will try to come up with a session where I can help you answer a lot of your questions so wholehearted wishes for your things 
either be the neat result or your exams for NSAT. I wish the best for everything for you. Thank you very much. Have a good night.